couple of minutes ago, I was talking about how we set things up. I, I think where I'll, what you have to keep reminding yourself is that just because you've set something up properly doesn't mean that it is maintained properly. So it's as much work to, it's almost as much work to then maintain things and make sure that things don't drift uh, and also to be agile to adapt your systems to the new variants and, and you know, uh, all that sort of, uh, all those challenges. So you need to have, you need to be sure that uh, not only the new people coming into the lab are, are well trained, but, but that the people who are already working in the lab uh, through uh, either just uh, becoming used to working in that environment, uh, that, the, that the systems don't degenerate uh, and that uh, things are done less well or become less safe. But also as your assays mature, you need to make sure that the SOPs are up to date and constantly revised and that people are sticking to those SOPs. So constant monitoring constant re-accreditation is, is really very important. Uh, and uh, as Sassy just said, the, vi and, uh, uh, the virus is not static, it's changing all the time. And so you can't be sure that the assays you've set up for uh, the original variants are still going to work uh, properly uh, with, with each new variant. So you need to uh, perhaps not revalidate the assay, but at least re-verify the assay for each of the, the new variants. Um, how do you incorporate the new workload on top of your pre-existing workload? Do you stop something? Uh, we certainly uh, are doing probably everything we used to do uh, and the COVID stuff on top. Uh, I think some of the HIV work in particular has suffered. Uh, from that, um, and some of our gene therapy work has been uh, more slow. We've had, we've definitely reallocated space. Things that we did in the PC3 lab uh, with HIV, we have found workarounds so that we can take that out and do it in the PC2 lab, so that we can dedicate the PC3 lab to uh, respiratory pathogen work. Uh, we've certainly changed uh, our management structure, mostly at the edges, but we've certainly reallocated re responsibilities. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, there have been people that have stood up to this challenge and really attacked it, and there are people that have sort of disappeared. Um, and so you need to, you know, uh, react to that and really reward the people that are up for the challenge. Um, and uh, And... You know, there has been uh, uh, an injection of funding uh, for research in this space, which a lot of which is coming to an end. And so uh, we've hired a lot of extra people. Uh, we have to manage how we transition those people either into other projects or, or uh, let them go gently. Uh, and that will be a challenge for this year, I'm afraid. Um, and, you know, particularly, I think it's true in, uh, particularly in the research uh, uh, area, but I'm sure my friend on the right here um, will speak, could speak volumes on this. You know, when you're developing this stuff, it's very competitive, it's very expensive. You need to a priori uh, set some stop-go criteria and if things aren't working or if they're not working as well as other people's uh, things, you need to stop and do something else. And certainly, you know, we've stopped doing any monoclonal development because uh, although we had things that looked very promising, they're probably not better than those that are available therapeutically and so we have stopped that, uh, that development completely. Um, Thank you. Um, the other, the other thing is, is how long does an emergency last, uh, and when do you scale back? And there are, you know, I, I'm also involved with a range of clinical trials, some of which involve people in uh, at at HIVNAT, uh, large global uh, uh, trials run through the Active Three network and the Insight network. Uh, and there are certainly among the leadership of those programs, there is big disagreement about how 
uh, how much of an emergency this still is. Uh, and there are people who are still feel that the emergency is just as, as, uh, as acute as it was at the beginning of 2020. Uh, and so how do you manage those different expectations? And, you know, a lot of people have been working very, very hard for very, very many hours. Uh, <laughs> One of them sitting next to me, I suspect, um, or two at least uh, sitting to my left. I, I'm sure I've been working very hard here in, in this country. And how do you manage uh, that constant stress and burnout uh, in your staff? And you need to be aware of that and make sure people take time away uh, and aren't working too long in the lab and, and putting themselves at risk by getting tired, particularly when they're working in all that PPE um, you know, and, you know, at the end, of, you know, often the time when people will infect themselves is when they're taking that PPP off, right, because it's potentially covered in virus at that point. And so they need to be still fresh enough to go through the procedure and of, of de-gowning and getting the PP off in a systematic fashion, in a safe fashion, and we actually have a buddy system to do that where people watch each other do that to make sure that that happens properly. Uh, I've said we've worked in large collaborative efforts. Uh, you have to uh, manage the egos and the tensions. Um, what has this brought to the lab? It's certainly brought new expertise and new capacity. And uh, as I'll talk about uh, in the next section, I, I think we've developed some platform, potential platform technology for so the phenotypic characterization of, of novel pathogens, which we've actually applied to, to monkeypox uh, very rapidly uh, last year. So, um, you know, the, these are the suites of, this is a, a, a summary of the suites of the assays that we developed. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through the assays in any detail, but, uh, you know, these, uh, these assays are fairly unique. Uh, the neutralization assay is very high throughput. It's done in 384 well plates. The 384 well plates are read on a high throughput, high content microscope uh, uh, on basically uh, color change. Uh, and uh, it's highly reproducible. So instead of the CPE being read by hand uh, and taking several hours for each of those 384 well plates to be scored, uh, we can score that in a matter of, of minutes. Uh, and so we can do assays that involve, uh, you know, 20 or 30 384 well plates. So we can screen responses uh, to vaccinations in immunosuppressed populations and that sort of thing very, very quickly across a screed of variants. Um, the, uh, you know, we, as I said, we uh, decided that we weren't going to uh, make the same mistakes as, as, as people had made with HIV. Uh, both myself and Stuart Turville, the chief virologist, remember that too, only too well. And I can remember we had a conversation on the phone on a Sunday afternoon uh, where uh, basically we decided we were going to develop these human cells. And so we took human cells and transfected them with both ACE2 and uh, TMPRSS2 and made literally hundreds and hundreds of different clones of those and then screened them for uh, 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 ability to be infected by the virus. And so we actually have a group of cells that uh, are either very uh, susceptible to the virus, which are useful for some assays, or less susceptible that are uh, appropriate for other assays. And basically, because we've got those, we can grow any of the variants of concern. Each of the variants that uh, of the new Omicron variants, we've managed to characterize very rapidly. And through that suite of assays that I just showed you, we can go from a new variant to having a neutralization profile against, uh, across five or six different variants uh, uh, with a new variant included in about a week now uh, from go to woe. Um, and so this is just uh, the reasoning for um, uh, why we built these uh, cells. Um, uh, the virus, can get in two ways, uh, and 
and you know a lot of the assays only measure viral entry by one of those pathways and because of the way we've designed our cell line we can we can look at uh, at, at uh, both pathways simultaneously and uh, because we have different levels of ex on different cells different levels of expression of ACE2 and TMPRSS2 we can mix and match the cells to uh, the new variants, depending on their, dependab their uh, dependability on uh, TMPRSS2 for entry. Um, and, you know, just as important as the laboratory stuff, having really good cohorts with really, so having really solid laboratory data, but having really solid clinical data that's prospectively collected, that's uh, collected in a standard fashion. Uh, has been really, really important. So the laboratory working hand in uh, glove with clinician scientists in the hospitals and in outpatient settings has been very, very important. And making sure that, you know, uh, coming from a background of uh, HIV and myself as an immunologist with large numbers of people uh, with autoimmunity, making sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, responses in people who are immunocompromised or immunodeficient. And just as important as this sort of high-end laboratory stuff is important, having the collaboration with the diagnostic labs to get the serological results, but having a really, really solid, high-quality biobanking is absolutely invaluable. So working with our biobanking group uh, and our clinical tri uh, trials processing group Bringing all those people together so they each know what they're doing uh, is really, really important to get, um, you know, the, the high quality data out. And, you know, the observations we made around long COVID, uh, which, you know, have sort of given us the first insights into the pathogenesis of long COVID, um, you know, wouldn't have been possible with all those things being together uh, and people working together. So having the coordination, the communication is really, really important. Um, uh, as is, you know, we've been very fortunate to be involved in these uh, global networks of, of clinical trials through the old Insight Network. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. It was very interesting, Tony.